Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello and welcome back to Fighting on Film. This week we're bringing you the fever dream that is Castle Keep. This is on paper an absolute rip roaring classic of a film but when it comes to it it's a little bit of a fever dream it's a bit trippy yes it is um this has been on the foth um spreadsheet for ages this one um yeah. so i picked it up cheap uh, in cex on dvd which if, you, if you're american or international listener um it's a very cheap sort of computer exchange shop where you can get dvds and games very heavily discounted um and it's always been sitting on the shelf, and we were arming and arming, and uh, and we consulted the the FOF archive, if you will, and we were like, yeah, Castle Keep, nineteen sixty nine, that looks interesting, and boy, did we mm. uh, let ourselves in for a, uh, an interesting time, treat, um, a, a yeah. treat, yeah. So, I mean, maybe Matt, fill us in with the production, and we'll go into cast, and we'll and we'll go from there. All right, okay. Well, as I said on paper, it seems like it's going to be, you know. A phenomenal film in terms of production and cast and everything that went into it. So we've got um Sidney Pollock directing, um, famous American director, producer, actor. Um, he won uh an Oscar for 1985's Out of Africa for both Best Director and Best Picture. Um, he's known for Scalp Hunters, uh, they shoot horses, don't they? Three Days of the Condor, um, the firm Tootsie. Um, he produced films yeah. like The Talented Mr. Ripley and The Quiet American um, and uh, Cold Mountain as well. So really well-respected director. Uh, the film was written by uh, Daniel Tradash, um, who's known for um, From Here to Eternity, uh, The Picnic, uh, Storm Center, along with uh, David Raphael, um, who's a longtime um, Pollock uh, collaborator. Uh, the, the the actual screenplay was was based on Castle Keep, a 1965 novel by William Eastlake. Uh, Eastlake was actually uh, a veteran of the Northwest uh, Europe campaign. Uh, he oh, was wow. a platoon leader, um, and he was wounded at the Battle of the Bulge in 1945, um, oh, wow. and was awarded a, a Bronze Star. Uh, cinematography was was handled by Henri Daquet. Um, part of the part of the French New Wave, very competent cinematographer. Um, probably uh, in terms of war movies, his other best known is, is probably Operation Daybreak in 1975. Um, in terms of um, the budget, we're looking at about eight million, but I couldn't find a box office. I don't know whether you did. No, I couldn't find anything on that. There's very, there's very little on this movie out there. To be fair, surprising, isn't it? Really, I, yeah. I had a look at a couple of, of Pollock books, and there was not a great deal out there to be. Uh, to be found music was by um michael legrand um who uh, did the uh, music for the 1968 original uh, thomas crown affair movie ice wow. station zebra in the same year and uh, the three musketeers in 1973 which is a, a favorite i do like that film mm. i like all, all three of those actually like a classic sunday afternoon films um the film was was shot in um in serbia um hence the wild number of uh, extras that we get in the film and, and the, the scale towards the end of it um yes. which really does add to the film i think um it, it was does. largely filmed in um Kamenica park uh in the city of uh, Novosad uh, or Novi Sad um and apparently the the castle was made out of styrofoam that was another little factoid that came up when yeah. i was trying to find behind the scenes stuff um and other than that, it probably has the best snow of any Battle of the Bulge film. It, yeah, very. There's actually snow in it, which is yeah. you know good. That you know, there's none in the Battle of the Bulge. Although 65. I did read that filming went on so long that the snow began to melt, and that became a little bit stressful for everyone. Yes, I read that as well. Um, Apparently, they were annoyed they were wearing winter uniforms, and it was like you know boiling hot. Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of continuity. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I also heard that apparently they, they did, uh, spoiler alert for a film that came out, you know, 50 odd years ago, um, that the, the castle genuinely burnt down 
And, and at the end of the movie, when you're seeing it burning, that's genuine footage of the castle burning. It's not, that's not controlled. Yeah, apparently, apparently Pollock was running backwards and forwards. Yeah. Um, with, with the K to try and like, this is great. as much as possible. This is great. Give me a camera on this. This is fantastic. <laughs> it's the genuine Roll audio it. there. <laughs> Rolling. <laughs> We've only got one shot at this. But that's, that's about it for production side of things. As we said earlier, there just isn't a great deal um, of information on it. Um, it's one of those interesting movies. It's It comes out in that sort of weird new Hollywood time where Bonnie and Clyde's come out. Hollywood's trying new things. And this is one of the movies that I think has, has come out in that period and was interesting and different. But I think it's been lost to time in its way. Um, but then when you segue seamlessly into cast here, when you look at the cast, the, some of the people in it are very timeless. So... Leading your film, you've got Burt Lancaster. Mm. You know, we've done, we've had Burt on quite a lot lately, really, when you think about it. Um, or it feels that way at least. Um, Academy Award winner, listeners to the show will know his back catalogue um you know very well. But he plays Major Falconer, he's very much the lead of the movie. Um, and and you know, listeners will know him from the professionals, the train, Twilight's Last Gleaming, Seven Days in May, Judgment at Nuremberg, prolific, classic Hollywood actor there. Um, then we have Patrick O'Neill as Captain Beckman. Uh, in terms of his war movies, he was in, in Harm's Way, King Rat and Under Siege in 1992. Uh, then we have Jean-Pierre Amont as the uh, Count of Maldoray. He's the, the owner of the castle. Uh, he was in assignment in Brittany, Charge of the Lancers, the 1955 Napoleon film, and uh, The Enemy General. Uh, Peter Falk, Columbo's back. Um, as he plays Sergeant yes. Rossi, um, he was in Anzio, Attack and Retreat, which is an Italian um, war film we need to do, and Operation Snafu. But obviously, as aforementioned, you'll know him from Colombo, um, hugely famous for that. Um, then we have Astrid uh, Heerin. She's a German model turned actress um, as Therese Del Maldore. She's the, the count, the countess. Um, she's a very small, uh, has a very small uh, credit list, but she was in the Thomas Crown Affair, Silent Night, Bloody Night, um, and seems to have, yeah, only own those four big credits, really. Then we have mm. Al Freeman Jr. as Private Benjamin. Now, he's kind of the, he's the writer of the group. So he, it, it's it, the movie, the way the movie works is that they say to Private Benjamin that he should write a book about this. And this, this, um, yeah. This film is essentially his book. Um, so he was in Torpedo Run, Sniper's Ridge, uh, Roots the Next Generations, and the film Malcolm X. Um, and in Roots the Next Generation, he played Malcolm X, which is quite an interesting little little sort of uh, oh, bit of trivia cool. there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then we have Scott Wilson as Corporal Clearboy. Uh, he was yep. in Young Guns 2, Geronimo, an American legend, uh, the 1995 Judge Dredd, uh, G.I. Jane, Pearl Harbor, The Last Samurai, and he also appeared as Herschel Green in The Walking Dead. Um, he did. Walking Dead old, fans that kind of there. a career resurgence, bit of a lift towards yeah. the end. Um, I think he died a couple of years ago now, didn't he? Ah, right. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Um, then we have Tony Bill as Lieutenant Amberjack. Uh, he's an actor and director. Um, he was in None But The Brave, Man From Uncle, Ice Station Zebra. And in terms of his directing credits uh, relevant to the show, he directed Flyboys, if you remember that. Oh. Of course back, he did. Back in the time, yeah. But from a few wow, months what back. a great film. <laughs> yeah. Absolute then, classic. Much like this film. Very interesting. It's what you say. The, what I, you say I mean, you... I can see, I, I can actually, no, I can't see any through a line <laughs> on it, but yeah, carry on. When you want to be non-committal, Matt, you just go, it's very interesting. Yeah, mm. just say that. It's, 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 get, get out of jail free saying, it's not bad, it's not good, it's just interesting. Um, then we have, James Patterson as Elk. Um, his credits include Silent Night, Bloody Night, um, Hawaii Five-0, the Mission Impossible TV series, and The Defenders. Um, then we have Bruce Stern, something of a, of a cult hero, um, as Lieutenant Billy Bix. Um, he's an Academy Award nominee. Um, he was also in Pollax, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? He was in Silent Running, The Burbs, Nebraska, The Hateful Eight, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, very much of that era and that 60s sort of new wave era but a, but a proper you know a proper uh proper cult cult character actor there then we have yeah. uh, katrina barato as the red queen she's the uh 
the mistress of the brothel that the uh, the, the American GIs find themselves in. Um, Ooh, she's an Italian that's, that's actress. A, that's a trip, that scene. I know, it really is. Uh, she was in a film called uh, Sallow, 120 Days of Sodom, Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half, and Campo di Fiori. And then rounding out the cast, um, we have Olga Beressa as Baker's wife. That's the character's name. Um, and it will become clear later why there's a Baker's wife. They really gave wife. her a backstory, didn't they? They really yeah. did. Um, uh, she's in Superfly TNT. She makes an appearance in The Spy Who Loved Me in a film called Safari Rally. So that's your cast there. And it's it's good. But I think that cast stands yep. the test of time yep. way more than the actual, the actual movie does. On- on paper, definitely. I mean, it's frustrating, isn't it? You you go into it and you're thinking, okay, it's going to be um, a late '60s exploration of um, man's duality uh, and conflict, and it's going yeah. to be an anti-war film. But then, even at the time, like New York Times critic uh, Vincent Carby, uh, can be um, said. Accomplishes the ju- the film accomplishes the dubious feat of being both anti and pro war at the same time. Yes, and that kind of sums it up a little bit for me in that this film is a little bit muddied. It's not a straightforward film, and it 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 leans heavily into the, you know that surrealism that came into film in the, in the late sixties. Mm. It's tonally all over the place. Um, so I yes. think maybe we should do the one where we've, doesn't uh, know whether the, it wants to be a comedy or a dark yeah. anti-war film or just an all out like show them up <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah or, or like a, or Kelly's Heroes Light in some places as well like I got that it, vibe from it yeah Kelly's Heroes does a big old lump of of um, of crack Kelly's maybe. Heroes on MDMA just goes, is, you know, L- on, yeah, yeah, on on LSD. <laughs> yeah. Pro- it's more, done a bumper time off a key. It's gone crazy. There. It's in a K hole. It needs yeah. to be taken home and made a cup of tea and bought a kebab at three in the morning. That's the best way to describe <laughs> Castle Keep. Um, it's Kelly's on Ket, everyone. <laughs> Things I thought I would oh never God. say on this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, getting into the one word reviews this week, we have. <laughs> historical firearms matthew moss goes with bread but he's written it in a long form which is bread <laughs> andy moody just says uh, looking forward to this one haven't seen it in years uh kevin gets goes with tripping paul hicks goes with unknown um jim Dudaku gives more of a, a few words but we'll, we'll let them in he says one of those insane 60s world war ii films that's more about the 60s than world war ii not very good all the action is very of its time and nowadays is a waste of time uh brian williams goes with eccentric yeah. um and simon whippet says just one more thing obviously got to get a colombo in there um i don't think i've seen it we'll check it out post review uh pete the paint says eye patch and ian davidson goes with unheard of so I think the general consensus was that this yeah. movie is kind of just I wouldn't say it's a lost film because it's definitely not. Yeah, I was I was going to be I was going to be um mildly humorous and have done the production for the keep rather than castle keep just for a laugh. <laughs> won't be the um, won't be the first time that we've come on the show yeah. and had to quickly scramble behind the scenes there for everyone. Um, there was a there was but, a week where Matt and me because yeah if you listen to the show for a long time, you'll realize that me and Matt alternate production and cast. And there was one week, I forget what yeah. movie it even was, but there was a, oh, I can't remember now. There was a moment where I, I went to do cast and Matt looked at his notes and he was like, hang on, I've got cast here as well. <laughs> so we had to pull production notes out of our ass essentially for that one, which was very funny. No, we, never we, know paused because... the, we paused the recording Went away and did our due diligence, Rob. Yeah, we didn't just pull it out of our ass. <laughs> no, but we essentially had to, really. But yeah, this one's an interesting Don't one. I think, it, as you say, it's just it comes out in an odd time. This is Kelly's heroes, but has gone too far. If that makes sense, like Kelly's is uh, accessible, and mm. it, it remains timeless because it doesn't go too far into the. You know the uh, the surrealist e- exploration of war um, yes. that films like this one do. So if you if you if you look at this film and you if you come into it 
like three through and there's a load of women in like burlesque outfits throwing brandy molotov cocktails at a teeth teeth 8485 mm. you go what the hell What's is this going on yeah if you came into it 45 minutes earlier uh, and it's it's a guy that's looking at it, it's the it's the the lieutenant lieutenant that's looking at the um painting in the parlor of the castle and it starts yes. moving <laughs> it comes alive you'd be like what the fuck what the like, is this? it's like tells the unexpected the, the, isn't it that's like what's going on yeah or the sequence where bert lancaster shoots seven um seven uh like members of a german patrol without taking any <laughs> you know possibility of return fire oh it's like, that's nails absolute nails is sequence. not cover but that 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 like bandstand is not bulletproof but yeah, apparently but... it is um <laughs> it's but <laughs> it's come on it is. it is. I. I mean, he sell. He sells being able to shoot all those guys. Oh, um, he does. Yeah. He's. He's taking the film bloody seriously. Just, I must admit, if that's the character, then fair enough. But if it's, if yeah. that's how he chose to mm. act it, someone does. Someone yes. needs to. Yeah. Um. We got Falk in the bakery, just like <laughs> absolutely gone. Gone. We'll talk about that in favorite scenes. I know. Yeah, but we will. He's gone. Will. He's just like bread. Bread. It's, I'm, it's I'm like, a baker here. Bread. I'm a, ba- I'm a baker now. And everyone's That's... coming in, going, "Can I get some bread?" <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, here you go." Like, I'm not. I, I don't want to do this, but I, I need someone. Needs someone needs to like explain to to Peter Falk that a bakery is a for profit business where you just can't <laughs> give bread to everybody. You actually need to like it's being the best socialist bread. baker he can be. He's giving it away for free. Absolutely true. To sort of back up what we've been saying there. I found a retro review from RogerEbert.com. It's not that retro. It's 2021 by Scout to Foyer as part of a series of unloved movies. And he says this. There's no way around how Sidney Pollack's Castle Keepers aged awkwardly. Half of its jokes don't land and never did. And it was written and directed by people who sacrificed artistry for cleverness. But there's undeniably a kind of odd magic at work here. How many people were interested in showing warfare as simply the province of absurdity and in showing the battlefield as not a transformative place, but simply a graveyard waiting for bodies? Released in 1969, Castle Keep is too cute, perhaps, to be the profound thing it intends to be, but there is a fairly accurate study of cabin fever, of living in a society that has lost its walls and ceiling, that we're all on our own now, and it's up to us to decide what happens next, at last, and I think we can all now relate on some level to that. Hmm, interesting. I think, yeah. that, I think it hits a number of interesting points there, like good points in that, a lot of the stuff doesn't land and probably didn't with audiences at the time either. No. Because some of it is just like, this is too either far out or just patently like not relevant to what we're doing here. Um, and I, yes. I think the mention of like cabin fever uh, is, is really interesting. And the, there's elements of, of this film that if you reshot it with the soundtrack of the shining, then oh yeah, you could, there's some, there's you could, some, yeah. You could have a really interesting mashup. That's for sure. Yeah. But no, I, there's a definite, feel and and atmosphere of of that cabin fever um mm. element to it but then totally the film shifts around so much that that doesn't remain for long it no kind of, it doesn't oh we're, we're isolated in this castle oh wait we can go to a brothel in the town which is like five minutes away yeah and the town's oh, on private by soldier the is apparently having weird a weird a weird relationship with a vw beetle and then yeah it, you know the, the out of nowhere, oh, a, f- a flare goes up like three miles away, the, and and Bert instantly knows that the entire German army is coming their way. And, and, he, and he, he holds a no, like, conversation telling, around. He holds that. a lecture telling them the entirety of the, how the, the bulge is going to go down, and he wouldn't know a damn thing. And I absolutely love that. I thought that was amazing. I I love the art lecture, the art lecture that the captain gives. Yeah. Because, oh my god! So that. The, the the film begins with a jeep slowly ambling down a potholed road yes. towards the castle, and we get some backstory. We get the 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 captain captain's backstory of he is um, there to look after artwork, or he's yeah. on like a like a bit of a monuments men esque kind of background to him. 
Um, yeah. There's the major, and then there's the the, the author, the writer. The, the I mean, this was me. better um, than Monuments Men. I'll, who's I'll, going to write the book? I'll about say all that now. <laughs> Monuments Monuments Men is is long overdue for a, um, a review on this show because well, Monuments Man, that Men was a waste, is that was a three, wasted three opportunity for a mini series cut down into a movie that doesn't bloody work. That's what I think Monuments Men is. <laughs> Monuments Men is. Do you remember that episode of The Simpsons where um, he invents a gun that applies makeup? That's yeah. Monuments Men. Wow. I mean, it just it just throws everything at you and expects it to stick. <laughs> is that what you mean? Because <laughs> because then Castle Keep is very much like Homer's makeup gun. I think that's <laughs> that's, that's true. Actually, that is true. Might be our most niche Simpsons reference. That's amazing. Yeah, but, that, but, that, but it works so well. That that's perfect. The per- you've done final thoughts already, like half an hour early. I think you've done it. <laughs> it's the makeup gun from the Simpsons. It's the makeup gun from the Simpsons. Hold still, Marge. This episode is going to be our castle keep. I can feel it. It is. <laughs> yes. People are going to listen to this and go, "Oh no, it's, this film's really bad." <laughs> I'm sat here with a typewriter just writing red rum over and over again. No TV and no beer. Make Burt Lancaster something, something. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we should take a breather uh, and get hope, to the alley tally. I hope still everyone sane. gets the Simpsons references that we push into this far too often. Of course yeah, they do. It. It's a, it was a cultural phenomenon. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, I mean, if you haven't worked out already, the film is a bit madcap, to say the least. But in terms of the Ali Tally this week, it's not actually that bad. Mm. Like, a, for, for what? For, for watch the trailer if you haven't, or indeed watch the whole movie. It's it's out there online. Um, like. The war movie part of it is is absolutely fine. There's not much going wrong for a late, yeah. a late 60s yeah. World War II um, American war movie. There's nothing wrong. You know, you've got BARs in there and one Garands. Uh, there's a really cool 50 cal on an aerial mount. It's really cool. Um, you get Peter Falcon yeah. on MG42, which is all, which is lovely to see. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. M1 Garands as well. Germans in Feldgrau. So I, I think maybe maybe without realizing it they're leaning into the tropes a little bit which kind of might help might help the film yes, in a way i think that's for um, um t84 uh, sorry t3485 is painted gray yeah um, love it classic uh, there's some, there's some there's great lines a about 3.5 inch rocket launcher that's, that's cool. used um which is it, it, yeah, it's great because when that oh, Jesus, the what a fever dream of a scene that is where the where the tanks coming into the church. Oh, I love it! And we'll just pretend that his his bow gun and his coax are jammed, and and the the, the <laughs> tanks coming into the church, yeah, and they're stumbling to reload, and he he aims the 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 rocket launcher, which is supposed to be a two point seven five inch, but we'll let them off. It's actually three point five, but that's very common. Um, it's an M twenty super bazooka. You look straight down the tube and there's nothing in it. And then he yeah, pulls the that. trigger and it, it I pulls love the that. tank off. It's I knew, classic trope. I knew you'd see that. I knew you'd see that. Yeah. But the thing I love about that scene is that he's reciting the Lord's Prayer, try, trying to like buy them some time. Yeah. And, then, and then he's like, shoot the goddamn son of a bitch. And then he fires it like right at the last moment. <laughs> It's really great. Hey, it's a good but scene. Th- that tank scene is, is quite funny, actually, because once they get in it, um, they're like, oh, well, do you think uh, Peter Fowler goes, well, do you think we can be arrested for wearing a German tank? Which is a great line. It's an incredible line. And <laughs> Fowler's delivery of that line is perfect. Yes. But Fa- what annoys me is where does the tank go when they get back to the castle? Fuck knows. I reckon they crashed it. Like there must be a, a yeah. cut scene and they Falk's like. Fowler's jammed up the, the, the like, the innards <laughs> with bread. <laughs> <laughs> they should have had it. I don't know why they didn't have a scene where the Falk like disables a tank by sticking some bread in the exhaust pipe or something. Like, <laughs> why did they not do that? Or like a baguette down the barrel, the, down the barrel of the gun. That would have been oh, amazing. That, that why that's a really huge missed open goal for <laughs> really, this kind of really film. Really is, yeah. Some um, some 
slapstick surreal bread action. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that, but yeah, the, the tanks are absolutely fine. That's a trope in itself. Um, mm-hmm. I I like the amount of uniforms that were on display because I just wasn't expecting to see them. Oh, that um, that scene where they the 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 guys are retreating through the town and there's yes. hundreds of guys. I mean, insane uniforms in there. It's like there's, yeah. there's absolutely wild stuff. Like duck hunters, and there's guys in like uh, parachute jump uniforms. Um, there's some random British troops in there, which yeah, which like means fully this decked mo- out. <laughs> which means this movie might be the only, the second movie to acknowledge the fact that there was a British contribution to the Battle of the Bulge, which I wish we had known about before we did our talk, because it would have been an insane. Oh my god! Can been... you imagine if we'd included it? <laughs> it would have been brilliant. <laughs> Two frames of a dude wearing a Brody with an SMLE. Exactly. And that gets into the talk. Yeah, it, it bloody would have done. Um, and then I, I love the fact that after that sequence, Bert Lancaster somehow is just now wearing a jump uniform for the rest of the movie. It just makes no yeah. sense. What, the, what's that about? Was Bert like, I'm too warm know. in this. I, I want to change. Yeah, might have been that, actually. That's a fair shout, you know. But, you know. That's the least weird thing of the film, to be fair. It is actually once once you get once you get to a certain point with this movie, no, nothing faces you. I think. Um, yes, that's very true. And um, the bit with Falk with the grenade is very cold. Oh yeah, that is good. Mm. That's a, that's a, a good grenade. I like it. Yeah, yeah. The more conventional war movie trope bits where they're digging in and things like that, you don't normally see mm. that in movies of this era anyway. So that was nice. Yeah, that's normally like sort of um, just br- like dusted over, isn't it? And we s- we see them like setting up their defenses and stuff, which is cool. And it turns into our last stand film, and it, yes. you know, that's the film's like sort of final um, tonal shift. Into Lancaster telling them being to, a last re- stand. to reposition a mortar, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. And Lancaster um, has. Do you notice his little dad run that he does? Once you notice the oh, way Lancaster all runs, all of the skipping over the tiny hedgerows, I was like, I "Oh, damn, it. that's cool." That's, it. that's a that. It's... And it lingers on him for an awfully long time doing that. He runs like <laughs> three hundred yards in that sequence. He can't shift that... at that. This point in his career, the, the knees are gone, and he's done so many westerns. Yeah, but he, but he's but he's making it look like he's moving. Mm. He does, you yeah. know, at, at speed. I only um, wish the film had gone as quick in that sequence because Christ, that is true. <laughs> yeah, the pacing, right? Um, but then I also like the just rounding out my Annie picks for this week is I love I love World War Two winter looks, so yeah I love great coats, Mackinac coats, uh, scarves, mm-hmm. uh, mittens, all stuff like that. I I love seeing it. Um, and there's um, we get um, a fair um, bit of that. We do. Peter Falk wears a lovely Mackinac in it. I love him. Um, he, he wears a lovely Baker's outfit. And a baker's outfit, which I never thought yeah. I would ever say. That man, um, that man is like the most flower-covered baker. Like <laughs> they, they turned to Peter and said, "Peter, you're a baker," and he he just ploughed his face into some flour and was like, "I'm a baker," and came back up and just that did was the scene. Co- that was the cocaine to get him through the scene. That's not flour. <laughs> it literally is like the this scene in Scarface where he like <laughs> covered it, just jams his head into a pile of flour. Yeah. <laughs> But no, but thank God. Um, and I think we'll seen. I think we'll transition to favourite scenes now because we we're getting there with Peter Falk with the bakery. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. So favorite scenes. So talking about uh, Peter Falk, there, Falk is the perfect actor for the role. There's no, for me at least, there's no one else. There's probably is someone else in that era. Maybe Don Rickles, maybe someone like that, comedic actor. But Falk has this conviction and the comedy to his acting. Yes, the timing. And the timing, yeah, to make this absurdity work. So Rossi um, reverts back to his pre-war occupation as a baker in, in an attempt to like sort of see out the war. It's clear he's going through some post-traumatic stress. Um, I think that's yeah. what he's trying to get at. And he reverts. So 
they all the lads learn that there's this town and there's a brothel and and falk's like oh there's a bakery um so he goes instead of there being oh you're not going to come to the brothel rossi's like no where, where there's a bakery there's a baker's wife um and which is an amazing line um and he sort of just adopts this family of his own um because the baker's gone a well <laughs> which is nuts that's a trope you know? in of itself it's crazy yeah so <laughs> and the and the wife just invites him to bed because he's a baker and she's a baker's wife yeah. um you know uh falk becomes the the fabulous ba- baker boy for a bit um and then near mm-hmm. the end of the movie this is my favorite scene this part now I'll segue into you just have to have the context there or this doesn't make sense um most like most of the movie actually <laughs> so near the end of the film uh falconer is trying to rally a force to defend the castle and stop the german advance yes so uh the lads F- falconer's chaps go and say go get go get rossi back and he's baking so you, you get a you get a sequence of them trying to convince him to come back in, into the fold for one last battle um, and he actually has some really interesting lines and he's probably the one of the few characters in the movie that actually gets fleshed out and you learn a bit more about him. Um, and he says, um, you know, do, do you want to, do you want to end the war? And he goes, well, I've been trying to end the war forever, basically. And he says, I landed in North Africa. I was going to end the war that day. Then in Normandy, then the next day, then the next week, when I, re- when I reached the Siegfried line, I figured out it right. I figured out, right. Maybe it's going to take me a year. But then when I realized it was going to go into centuries, I came here, started a small family in a reasonable business. It's just, just amazing. And he's in he's in the baker's whites. He's got it's a flower the, all over his it's face. It's the reasonable business bit that gets me. It's just, just, yeah. just so, it's so bizarre. I love it. Exactly. It's just like, and, and the then, baker has is, is gone off and been killed in the war, yes. sensibly. Um, mm. And he... He just takes that family under his wing. He does. He really does. And then he has a great, another great line, like two seconds after that, where they're saying about you know how are you going to stop a German tank? You know they don't they don't just give them up type of thing. And they say, oh, with a bazooka. And he's sort of saying he's talking about something else, and he leans into the guy who's just said about a bazooka, and like reverting back to being a soldier, he goes, um, uh, you know how are you going to take a tank away from the Germans? It's theirs. And he goes, and he just leans and he goes, aim for the track. They bounce off the armor, and then he goes back on to talk about baking. It's just, it's, it's like a Michelin web sketch. It's like, it's just, it's just so well timed. That sequence there gets the comedy that the movie was going for, and the yeah, absurd. that's a very good point actually. That's for me the own. This is the sequence where it works because you've got your strongest comedic if- character. If they just made the comedic element one or two characters, mainly Falk, I think yes. the film would have been a lot stronger because a lot of it is just weird. There are too many jokes hit. that don't land. Yeah. And it detracts. I think it detracts from the from it. I would agree. The Falk, the Falk Baker scenes are great. Um, I do love those. They're personal favorite as well. Um, mm. I like the whole in action in the town. I like that. I, lo- I love the way really that, good. Um, that's actually Lancaster really good. is shot on that horse. Um, yeah. I, I mean, cine- cine- cinematography. Oh, fuck me. The camera work. That I mean, in terms of <laughs> cinematography. Yeah. The camera work. Yeah. Um, it's very I, good. Not, not how he's actually shot on the horse, but um, no. it, it looks great. And the bit where um, he finally rallies a group of men by using Bruce Dern and his band of religious um, conscientious Bruce objectors. Dan, Bruce zealots. Dan's carols, like singers, it's just Which is absolutely insane. nuts. Yeah. Yeah. He's there, like, that's another great sequence with Falk, actually. So he is actually, Bruce yeah. Dern's outside the, the, the brothel singing Christmas carols and, and like, shouting about how, um, you know, sins are being committed inside. Yes. Falk comes outside with his rifle and he's like, Can, can you not? <laughs> can you not? I'm trying, yeah. to, I'm trying to ingratiate myself with the baker, baker's yeah. wife, and this reasonable business. <laughs> yeah. In my and small and family. he's just like, You wake up the whole town and he, he, he fires like, like he fires the rifle in the air. And Bruce Den's like, Shocked. <laughs> yeah. And, and you think, Oh, that, that's really weird. Are we going to see Bruce Den and the boys again? And we do. We because do. Because he runs into um, 
Burt Lancaster, Major Faulkner. Uh, or, uh, and he's trying to rally these retreating men. He he says, like, where's your officer? Um, where are you going? To a couple of them. And he says, my officer's up there. I'm going over there. And th- there's a lot of, like, dazed dudes in the crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he realizes he needs, like, a song. Like a Pied rally Piper, them. almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. About to say that myself. And he gets Bruce Dan and the boys to sing at the at the the muzzle of a, of a nineteen eleven. He's like, <laughs> yeah. just just sing. I need you to sing. He's like, I, I don't want to lead these men off into back into war. And and he's apparently Bruce Dan's convictions aren't strong enough to prevent him from doing this because he does it. And he yeah. he manages to 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 gather a, a looks like about two hundred guys. And you think, oh, okay, this is that's going to make defending the castle much easier. Yeah. Oh no. They they go around the side of a building. Um, you got Bert on his white horse, um, followed by the Pie Piper, Bruce Den and his boys, and then this, you know, hundred or so guys. And then an artillery barrage lands, destroys the building, kills all of them. Everyone. Yeah. All of them. Except for, for Bert of, of of course. Yeah. And he comes riding back through the, the dust and the debris. And it's a brilliant shot. I love that. The only um, thing that ruins it is you get a Ter- Terence Malick thin red line, tambourine falling down in the middle of the debris, <laughs> like wishy washy shot, which I fucking hated. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's Terence. He's, he's struck early. Um, but the the whole holding town, holding the town section of the film is. It's quite fun. It's it's yeah. well done. It's well shot. It it leads nicely into the, the the final act of the film. There's there's some surreal bits where they're using like just a cardboard box as cover. Um, yeah, I like that. It, <laughs> that, that, that really guy, leans. A into guy drugs. runs across the street at one point to take cover in a in the smallest shell imaginable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Is that the guy with the thirty cal? And he goes, "I'm going to take cover over yeah. there. I'm going to move." And the two guys sort of react like he's crazy. I really, I really love yeah. that. See that little sequence there. There's so many. I think that's Pollack trying to show the absurdity of some of these sequences at the time. Because it feels that way. Mm-hmm. Like there's a German that runs into the middle of the street and like takes a machine gun position up and the guys just light him up because he's not he's yeah. not like in any any cover. Um you, you know, it's just it that sequence technically is very good. I I think it's a much better than the latest. Fault with the grenade as well in that bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's that for me is the stronger sequence. Of, of action that we get i think the bit at the end is too yeah. over the top the, the 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 climax of the film almost feels a little bit rushed in in mm. the 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 germans kind of just overwhelm the defenses very quickly which mm. not not unbelievable no, um, there's not many not unbelievable you know um yeah exactly um but i think Pollock captures that you know the weight of the advance quite well because it's quite tightly shot. Um, yes, from 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 uh, about ninety degrees off to the, the the German advance and the defense, so it gets like this, um, kind of almost just a very straightforward linear view of of what's going on for some of the mm. the actual like shots. Um, there's there's the bit where um, they're they're all wounded, and they're in like a dried up pond. Yes. Um, Falk and the lieutenant and someone else. And, um, you know, they're about to make a, a, a break for the moat to, to swim across the moat. So they drop the, the drawbridge down um, so they can get into it. And the camera lifts up and sees just how close the Germans are to them. Mm. And the, the voices kind of fade away. And you never see them again. And I, I thought that was really well. Um, so yeah, like and it implies and they shot. died, didn't it? Like that they imagined mm. it. They didn't actually do it. And that I think that yeah. sequence doesn't hit as much as it could because it takes so bloody long for you to get there. And if and if mm. and I was watching it, and I'm not saying that I know you know what was going to happen or anything like that, but I guessed that they were dead because it was taking so long. I was like, oh, hang on, they're not they're not going to make it, are they? Yeah. And I was if you if you're ahead of the movie in your brain, you're like, come on, you're just waiting for it to happen. And then it and then any sort of goodwill yeah. that scene creates. 
and we're getting into final thoughts again, we always do it, but then it's sort of, it's killed off like five minutes later when you've got like fire engines coming through and Burt Lancaster. Oh my God, I forgot the about moment. the fire engines. And That's insane. And, and Burt Lancaster's shooting like 10 million rounds out of this 50 cal and like it goes a bit yeah. like, goes a bit like westerny sort of last defend the fort type vibes. And it's just, yeah, any sort of good graces the film builds up, it it's really happy to kill them off quickly. And that might be Pollack's vision, but and it doesn't make I think it a... is because, and I, I think that's, that's it. I, I think that is Pollock's vision of to have this huge, ridiculous climax, the grandstanding of, of Lancaster on the 50, the castle burning down. And I think, what he's trying to get across is though it's it's a almost a pastiche of that 60s 50s um tendency to have a huge final climax battle where everything either gets destroyed or killed and i think that's very true but before we move into final thoughts i thought i'd round up some of my um favorite scenes sure um i we've got to talk about um the scene with the vw Oh, it's like um, a Mighty where, Boosh sketch. Well, Lancaster. Well, let's talk about the first part where it's like introduced. L- Lancaster comes over and talks to um, Wilson, and it's implied that he's having a sexual relationship with the VW Beetle. It's nuts. Um, which is absolutely insane, and probably the first time I, I, most audiences of the day would have encountered the concept of a human being being physically attractive to a piece of machinery, which is a thing. I've forgotten the term for it, but it is a thing. I remember yeah, watching yeah, a Lou yeah. Theroux documentary about it. <laughs> That was one of the weird weekend ones, I think. I think it um, might have been, you know, yeah. And, and, and Lancaster sort of explains, sorry, Wilson sort of explains to Lancaster um, why he loves the car. It's, it's like, it doesn't need any water. It's like it, it, <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like a mechanical horse. It, it drinks a thimble full of oil. I love it, and 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 Lancaster's so far gone at this point, and just is just like okay, all right, carry on, and walks you away. Do you, you and do then you, later sunshine? on, later on, a couple of the guys push the the beetle into the moat, thinking it's going to sink, and and like a bit of spite. Ha, ah, Wilson's girlfriends in the moat kind of thing yeah, and nuts. it floats to the surface it's surreal and he pulls out his pistol and starts trying to shoot it in order to <laughs> yeah. let the air out of it I, that, that just stopped the film dead for me i was like did. why is it this did. in here like that is not gonna doesn't hit it doesn't no. make sense and it doesn't do anything for the plot or characterization it's insane yeah and then he and then he drives Moving on it to out another, of the street. Another aspect which of the is film. Fucking crazy. Yeah, and then he he, he no. The what how does he get into the moat, Rob? He Fuck goes, no, he, he goes, Oh my god, the car. <laughs> this movie he goes to run like, logic. around through the he goes to run and and like go through the, the drawbridge, etc. And someone goes, No, not that way, go that way, it's quicker. And he he sort of like, <laughs> doubles back on himself, goes through yeah. a door that opens out just opens out into into nothing he runs through it and falls into the moat below yeah and then swims into the car and drives it out and it's it's, it's just... crazy it was like it was as i said it's like a mighty boosh sketch it was like something out of monkey dust like if you if, if listeners know what monkey dust is um, and it while was like all that. this is going on bert lancaster is knocking off the count's wife yeah um and there's a whole tension of the with the count and the countess and Lancaster in this weird love triangle yeah. where the count wants a child. He's impotent and he wants a child. And he's like, I'm just going to put up with it and, and yeah, hope I get a fine. child out of this. And I'm like, okay. And there's a bit where he hands the count of like uh, a pistol when they're defending the, the bandstand from that German patrol. That's it. And, and he kind of considers shooting the, shooting Lancaster in the back. Um, yeah. but doesn't and then it's there's a com- there's a number of conversations where he explains the concept of him wanting a child etc and, and it's too just much going on so it's it's odd. too much going on at the times um 
I think maybe that does bring us into final thoughts. Like some of the scenes are very interesting and done yeah. in an interesting way. So the as we said, like the battle sequences are good enough. I think it's I think it's a worthwhile watch, but boy, you're in for a hell of a ride. Like, and then it's but then I think at the end of the day, when all is said and done, and you, you sort of reflect on the movie, tonally it is so wishy-washy, it really doesn't know what it wants to be. And it, and it it's just a little bit flawed. Like the concept is interesting, but it's not, it doesn't lean in too far one way it doesn't lean in too far off the other and i think f- kind of like mm. an absurdist comedy tongue-in-cheek kind of war film kelly's heroes a year later just yeah. gets it much better like uh, kelly's heroes just gets mm. that formula and i think the cast is better as well in kelly's heroes as well even though i love lancaster and i love falk if, if this movie had yeah. more recognizable stars in it i think it might have survived the years a little bit kinder because it's just there's too much of one not too much of the other and it, i think i it think misses its mark it misses it that's it its mark yeah quite it does a considerable margin doesn't it mm, it's mm. just a little bit too avant-garde it's trying to be too surrealist it doesn't really achieve what it aims to and i go back to that quote from i think it was new york times where he says it has the distinction of being both anti and pro-war at the same time yes and i don't think the film's supposed to be pro-war i just think that it tonally as we've said it misses the mark in that it doesn't quite nail down the anti-warness of it or at Mm. times it isn't clear enough with what it's trying to say the climax is pretty spectacular you know there's some great dialogue that we've talked about there's a lot of ponderous sort of like pseudo high concept stuff going on with paintings coming to life and people having monologues, the art historian giving a talk to people that aren't interested in it. It reminds Um, me of uni. I was like, fuck hell no, not again. It was like the the least engaged. That was like a Friday afternoon seminar. That was what that was. Everyone wants to go to the pub. And as, as we've said, it tries to be humorous. Yeah, it does. It tries to be funny. It tries to be humorous. But tonally, it just moves too too far across the spectrum too rapidly Mm. all of the time. And and it's it's doing anti-war. It's doing surreal. It's then doing sort of a last stand film. But then it's also trying to pastiche the the absurdity of the climaxes of contemporary Mm. war movies. Mm. And it's also trying to do that thing where the film looks at the absurdity of war and conflict by putting it into a surrealist kind of optic where, oh, we're in a brothel and there's a woman playing an organ. And How mad. How mad is a, this, guys? painting Ooh. having a chat with me. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, the, 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 the prostitutes are now throwing Molotov cocktails at the tank yeah. without you can any hear, problem at, at all. At times, I feel like you can hear like a director or a producer going, oh, look, guys, look how crazy this is. This shouldn't be in a war film, should it? Oh, look. You know, Mm. that's how I kind of feel Mm. at certain times. That's just what the movie's going for. It's kind of just trying to be like, this shouldn't be in a war film, guys. How crazy is this? And you're thinking, well, yeah, yeah, it would work if you cut out some of the slower sections and you really, like, like micro... You find that comedic tone that you're trying to go for. Yeah, exactly. If it was quicker... If the jokes were funnier, if you had more of Falk, I think it might be a much better movie. Um, because it, it just... There's other films do uh, uh, an ex- explorations of the absurdity and the tragicness mm. of war better. Oh, we I mean, must Look at the Bridget Ryan Megan. That does, that does, that does uh, this. an examination of, um, you know, the absurdity of... of throwing men against a you know something that isn't going to be there for long you know yeah, yeah. and i don't think this film nails the the the, the necessary tragic realism so there has no. to be some sort of element that really binds mm. everything together and i mm. don't think this film quite achieves it but no. nevertheless it was interesting yeah it was I, I i would recommend it in terms of you know if you're a fan of like uh, the genre um, the genre, if you're a fan of cinema history, seeing how new Hollywood was, was sort of the the new wave of Hollywood directors and yeah. the way of Park's filmmaking. approach to a war movie. 
it, exactly like it, it it's one it's one to check out just to see where the genre can go and it's not just another black and white you know the good guys shoot left the bad guys shoot right type thing it's yeah. not just that um yeah. but i can see if why you, it has if you can forgive some of the surrealist elements yeah it is a film that does make you think a little bit i suppose and if you're a Columbo is fan, its aim i suppose I mean, check out falk bacon it's got falk yeah bacon and bazookas bread bread there you go there's the three the three b's of castle keep there so <laughs> Yet again, uh, thanks again for listening to Fighting All Film this week. That was Castle Keep, 1969. Bit of a mad one. I think it fried our brains a little bit. Um, please go and do check this it out. This is definitely our Castle Keep episode. Yes, it is. Yes, it is our Castle Keep episode. Uh, next week, we have uh, Paul Epstein on the show for an interview. He is a d- uh, documentary film maker and producer um, out in America. And we're going to be talking to him about all things making documentaries. And I'm sure a lot a lot more as well. So do join us for that next week. Keep abreast of uh, everything that's going on in the show on our social media. You can check us out on Twitter at Fighting On Film. Oh, no, X now, sorry. X um, at Fighting On Film. I'm never going to get used to that. I think um, we're also on threads. We're on Instagram. Threads, Instagram. You can find us at fightingonfilm.com. That's the main one to go to. Yeah, please go there. We've got some new shirts out available as well. Um, we do. Celebrating our recent 150th. But I think that's about it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.